The whole situation around Frankie de Jong and his potential move to Manchester United really is an enigma. Because to me, it's not just a simple question of whether you signed de Jong or another player. There are several questions within that one question, which I will be covering throughout this whole video. So watch till the end to get a full in-depth breakdown. And those questions center around Kobe Mainu and whether he's too similar to de Jong and whether United would be better spending big money on a different style of central midfielder. The financial package around the de Jong move because it will be expensive despite despite Barcelona's financial situation. But to me, the biggest question is around who else United sign in central midfield. Because I think in order to come to a full answer as to whether United should sign De Jong this summer, rather than isolating it down to De Jong and another individual central midfielder, you need to be looking at it as a pair. Because realistically, United do need two central midfielders this summer because they're going to be getting rid of at least three of Casemiro, Amrabat, Eriksen and McTominay, maybe even all four. And even if you do promote Dan Gore into the first team, you likely still need to bring in another central midfielder alongside De Jong or whoever else you spend big money on. And I think I have two central midfielders that United could sign this summer for a relatively decent financial outlay in terms of the salary, but also the transfer fees that both players would command. But before I tell you who those two players are, if you're a fan of retro jerseys, head over to Jersey FIFA. You can check out all their Manchester United retro jerseys from the 90s and 2000s, as well as other club and international sides as well. If you use code Atlantis at checkout, you'll get a discount. A link will be in my Instagram bio, which will be linked in the description. So if we ignore De Jong for a minute, the two players that I think United should be looking to sign this summer would have been Bubakar Kamara and Alex Garcia. But Kamara's picked up an ACL injury, and so the likelihood is you don't really want to take a risk on him, particularly when he's going to cost around 70 to 80 million pounds this summer, and so the player I would sign instead of Kamara would be Amadou Onana from Everton. And for me, just watching Amadou Onana and Alex Garcia this season, I think you potentially have two world-class central midfielders. And whilst Onana would be expensive, costing around the same amount as Frankie de Jong, probably between 60 to 65 million, Alex Garcia at Girona has a release clause of just 10 million pounds. Now I should say that United will have to move quick in order to sign Garcia as there is interest from Barcelona and I'd be surprised if Real Madrid aren't looking at him as a potential Tony Cruz or Luka Modric replacement as well. But once you factor in that Barcelona are probably dependent on selling De Jong to a side that Manchester United in order to then bring in players this summer, the chances of United signing Alex Garcia do seem a lot better. And in my opinion, looking around the transfer market for the summer, you're going to struggle to bring in a better midfield combination than Onana and Garcia. But before I analyse how Onana and Garcia would fit into United's central midfield from a tactical point of view, alongside Kobe Mainu, let's first analyse Frankie de Jong and what he would actually bring to Manchester United, whether he's as good as people make out, and if he's actually the type of central midfielder that United need. Now straight off the bat, I don't think there's any denying that when it comes down to sheer ability, Frankie de Jong is one of the best central midfielders in world football. But to me, his career trajectory actually reminds me of a former Barcelona central midfielder. And even though they do have different attributes, I think once I make the comparison, you'll understand why. But in terms of what type of central midfielder de Jong is, he's what I would term a roaming playmaker. He's fantastic in the build-up phase, he's got the press resistance to match pretty much anyone in world football. Being able to receive the ball on the edge of his own box with his back to go under pressure immediately, and having the composure, technical ability, and fluidity in his movements to be able to feint to go one way before dropping a shoulder, unbalancing the pressing player before diverting away and driving forward into space. And when it comes to this particular skill, you could probably argue that De Jong is the best in the world. And we can see this clear as day statistically when we look at his FB ref report. Over the past 365 days, when compared against every other midfielder in Europe's top 5 leagues, De Jong ranks in the top 1% and 99th percentile for his carries into the final third, as well as the 97th percentile for his overall progressive carries. He also ranks in the 75th percentile for his successful take-ons, as well as the 63rd percentile for the percentage of take-ons that he's actually completing. And bearing in mind, his progressive carries and his carries into the final third aren't even factoring in his carries from the defensive to the middle third, which to me is probably the main asset of his game, but it just shows how good De Jong is when it comes to carrying the ball up the pitch, but particularly in the build-up phase in the defensive third, having De Jong dropping into that deep single pivot position will completely change United's build-up phase, because even while Kobe Mainu is a significant improvement on the likes of Casemiro and Amrabat when it comes to his press resistancy, De Jong is just another level completely. 
Now I'm sure the majority of you probably already understand how important it is for United to be able to play out of pressure and the significance that's going to have further up the pitch. But in a few minutes when I come on to how De Jong would fit into this United side tactically, I'll analyse the tactical implications of this in more depth. But I'm sure the fact that De Jong is pretty much as good as you could get in terms of being able to carry the ball through midfield is not a shock to anyone watching this video. But what exactly do the stats in these FB ref reports show about his creative passing? Well, just by looking at the passing section in these FB ref report, I think you pretty much get the picture. When it comes to being able to retain possession and circulate the ball efficiently, De Jong is pretty much as good as you can get when it comes to his short and medium passes. And even his long passes as well, he's completing a high percentage of lows, around 75%, ranking in the 85th percentile. But the real eye-catching metrics come when you look at his creative passing, as he ranks in the 99th percentile, the top 1% when it comes to his progressive passes and his passes into the final third, as well as the 90 7th percentile for his passes into the penalty area as well. And you can probably also see that he ranks in the 97th percentile for his expected assists, his XA, as well as the 79th percentile for his XG assisted. And I know a lot of you are probably wondering what exactly is the difference between these two metrics. And to be fair, when FB Ref first introduced XG assisted or expected assisted goals, alongside expected assists, I was actually wondering the same thing. But even though it is a bit of a tangent, let me explain the difference. So the key distinction between XA, expected assist, and XG assisted written as XAG is basically that XA considers all the passes that lead to a scoring chance, regardless of whether the chance is ultimately converted. But on the other hand, XG assisted solely focuses on the pass that directly contributes to the expected goal. And whilst I do have to admit that the naming of the terms is a bit confusing, it does make sense. So basically, expected assist is probably more for deeper line midfielders, players like Rodri, Tony Cruz, etc., who whilst are probably going to have a high volume of passes that actually move the ball up the pitch and actually contribute to a chance actually being created, they're not necessarily going to have the high volume of passes actually creating that chance directly. And so what you can see from De Jong's FB ref report is that his passes significantly contribute to Barcelona actually creating goal scoring opportunities in the final third, but whilst he certainly isn't terrible when it comes to actually creating them chances himself, ranking around the 80th percentile, he's only around the top 20% for his XG assisted, whereas for his expected assists he's in the top 3%. And so we can see statistically that De Jong is very much more of a creative deeper line midfielder rather than a creative advanced midfielder. And from this statistical analysis you're probably wondering why it's even a question as to whether United should sign De Jong. As from all the statistics that I've just provided, it seems like De Jong is as good a creative central midfielder as you can get. But this is where we come on to the former Barcelona central midfielder that De Jong's career trajectory reminds me of, and it's actually De Jong's current Barcelona manager Xavi Hernandez. Now if you are signed up to my Patreon where you can get a 7 day free trial which will be linked in the description, you would have already heard how impressed I was with Frankie de Jong's performance against Napoli in the Champions League a few days ago and I will be bringing some of that analysis into the video later on. And the reason why Frankie de Jong reminds me of Xavi is because while Xavi was certainly regarded as one of the best central midfielders in Spanish football, winning the Spanish player of the year in 2005, it was only when he got into his late 20s around 2008 when he was 27-28 he fully established himself as a world-class central midfielder. Up until that point, it was clear Xavi had all the attributes to be this sort of central midfielder, but he just needed a system to fully reach his level. And the same for me goes for Frankie de Jong. As like Xavi, de Jong has phenomenal technical ability in the centre of the park, being able to knit together sequences of play with short, sharp passes, and being an efficient circulator of the ball. But whenever I watch Frankie de Jong, even though the attributes are clear, the statistics show this, I do still think he has another level to go to fully reach that world-class class central midfield status. And so the question comes, how could De Jong be integrated into this United system to fully get the best out of him? What specific role would he play, but also what roles would the players around him play? And after we do this, we're going to come on to Amadou El Nana and Alex Garcia and fully evaluate whether Frankie De Jong is the right signing for United to make this summer. So the main improvement that De Jong's going to bring to this United side is certainly in the build-up phase. And in order to enable him to do this to his full capacity, you want him dropping into that deep single pivot position. Now, a lot of people will look at this and question whether De Jong has the defensive capabilities of playing as the deepest midfielder in central midfield. But I have to stress, this isn't a fixed position. In the video I did on Casemiro and him dropping into 
into the back line. Creating a back five, it meant that United's fullbacks were essentially playing on paper in the middle and defensive third. Some people pointed out that they didn't think Dalo had the capabilities of playing as a wing back going forward. Now, regardless of whether you think Dalo does have these abilities, personally, I think he would. It doesn't really matter because he's not playing as a wing back in possession. Dalo would still be playing in that normal position that we see him play for Ten Hag, inverting in field, playing in the double pivot, whilst pushing up down the flank as well to provide the overlapping runs. And the same goes for Frankie de Jong. Whilst in the build up phase, he is dropping in as a single pivot, this doesn't mean that out of possession he's playing as a holding midfielder. And this is a role that Xavi has De Jong playing in for Barcelona, as Andreas Christensen is the holding midfielder out of possession, but in the build-up phase Xavi recognises that he's got to drop De Jong into a deeper position and keep Christensen slightly higher, just because De Jong is much better in this phase of play. And so De Jong wouldn't be playing as a single pivot out of possession, but in the build-up phase he would be dropping into this Busquets role, just as he did for Barcelona against Napoli, moving into the spaces where he sees fit, and helping United progress the ball out of the defensive third, just as he did so well against Napoli for Barcelona. And the reason he's perfect for this role in the build-up phase is because of his fluidity and press resistance, capable of receiving possession, shielding the ball, dropping a shoulder, and then driving into the space. And even though Kobe Mainu could do this as well, De Jong's just a different level. But in the middle third, De Jong is essentially going to become a deeper line playmaker, playing the same sort of role that we saw Xavi play for Guardiola, sitting in front of the opposition's midfield line and being the dictator of play. And whilst he excels at turning out of pressure and driving into space, the question comes, does he have the passing ability to progress the ball into the final third? We certainly showcased this against Napoli, playing a number of incisive midfield splitting passes into the likes of Gundogan and Pedri sitting between the lines. And this is the role he would take up for United, essentially playing in that double pick in Ten Hag's 3-2-5 system or in a double pivot in any other system under a different manager as well. But you don't just want De Jong holding this deeper position in the middle third and this is where we come on to the role of a roaming playmaker. Whilst initially De Jong is going to be starting in that 3-2 rest defence, you want the defensive security maybe from the fullback Dalot or one of the two central midfielders alongside De Jong to be able to drop into that deeper role and allow De Jong to push forward. And this is what I think will enable De Jong to get to the next level, as he's already phenomenal in the defensive and middle third, but it's in the final third where he needs to add more creativity to his game, and using him in this roaming playmaker role is going to allow him to do this. He can drop deep in front of the opposition's midfield line, dictate play and circulate possession efficiently, whilst also progressing the ball via his incisive and long passes, but with a player like Mainu alongside him, and even Dalot and maybe the left back as well able to invert and take up his position in the 3-2 rest defence, De Jong can be given the freedom to push up between the lines, either carrying the ball forward into the space and carrying it into the final third himself, or exchanging some passes before making a movement from in front of the opposition's midfield line to in behind the midfield line. And I am going to come on to how I think Frankie de Jong can actually get to that world class level by looking at how he can mould his game after a former Premier League player. But let me first look at what would commonly be regarded as the weakest part of De Jong's game, which is his output defensively. Now he certainly isn't the all-conquering, combative, ball-winning midfielder that Amadou Onana is. And when I come on to analysing Alex Garcia and Amadou Onana in United central midfield as opposed to De Jong, you'll be able to see the advantages of having a player like Onana in central midfield, but I should say, whilst De Jong definitely doesn't have the athleticism or physicality to be able to eat up yards on opposition midfielders, and being able to constantly bring opposition counter-attacks to a grinding halt, he certainly isn't a liability defensively in the same way that someone like Christian Eriksen is. He is capable of putting in a tackle when needed and actually can time a sliding tackle pretty well. But what really impressed me in the game against Napoli was his defensive awareness and his positioning. There were a number of times where Barcelona's centre-backs Inigo Martinez and Ronald Arejo, because they were going man for man inside of the box, were often dragged apart. And De Jong actually did a great job of recognising this and dropping into this vacated space, which actually allowed him to make a vital clearance from a Matteo Politano cross. And there was also a Napoli attack where Frank Andre and Guiza looked to make an underlapping run between Barcelona's left back and centre back, and De Jong was quick to recognise this run and track it all the way into the box. And so, whereas players like Christian Eriksen or even Casemiro at times this season often seem to lack the awareness to track these sorts of runs into the box, De Jong has definitely matured into the type of central midfielder that can take on these defensive responsibilities, meaning that he doesn't have to solely play in a midfield three but could also play in a midfield double pivot if needed as well. But this is where we come on to how Frankie de Jong can move into that world class bracket. And I actually think it would be a good idea for him to mould his game on former Premier League player and his current Barcelona teammate Ilkay Gundogan. 
Because Gundogan, like Frankie de Jong, during his time at Borussia Dortmund, and even during the start of his career at Manchester City, was really a central midfielder who would operate in deeper areas, in front of the opposition's midfield line. But when Rodri came in around 2019-2020, we saw Pep Guardiola give Gundogan more license to push up in behind the opposition's midfield line, playing as a free eight, and he developed into a goal-scoring midfielder, and we can see this from this example against Newcastle. So here we see as Bernardo Silva receives the ball on the edge of the final third on the right side, that Gundogan is slightly in front of the Newcastle midfield line. But rather than holding his position in this area, as we would often see Frankie de Jong do for Barcelona, here we see Bernardo Silva work the ball down the right side, and Gundogan makes a move into the box between Newcastle's right back and centre back, essentially becoming a second striker alongside Erling Haaland. But this is exactly why Gundogan was able to add so many goals to his game, as he understands where the chance can be created from. He knows that Bernardo Silva eventually is going to look to come inside on his left foot, and so he picks up a position towards the back post, and so when Bernardo Silva eventually does come inside onto his left, Gundogan is almost a free man, with Trippier picking up Foden at the back post, and Fabian Schaar on Erling Haaland, which allows Gundogan to make a free run into the six-yard box, controls Bernardo Silva's in-swinging cross immaculately, and puts the ball into the back of the net. But here we see an example from a less transitional Manchester City attack. You can see as Carl Walker, who is inverted in field from right back, receives the ball in a central position, that Gundogan is now sitting in behind the ball of midfield line rather than in front of it and this means that when Walker's able to play the midfield splitting pass into the space Gundogan can exchange a quick one-two with Erling Haaland and he's able to run off of Haaland's static positioning into a 1v1 position where he finishes once again and I think this is the key for Frankie de Jong getting to that world-class level as in the defensive and middle third he has all the attributes already to be a world-class central midfielder he just needs to add the timing of his run into the box in the final third as well as the finishing ability when the opportunity comes. And I think that displays exactly why I want Frank de Jong to have more of a free role in the Manchester United midfield, which I'm now going to tactically break down. When I'm talking about how Frank de Jong would fit into the Manchester United midfield, I'm also going to be suggesting an Amadou Onana alternative as well, which I'll come on to in just a bit. So as I said at the start of the video, when judging whether United should sign Frankie de Jong this summer, you do need to factor in who else they would bring in in central midfield as well. And for me, whilst I don't think Frankie de Jong is a defensive liability and could definitely play in a double pivot with Kobe Mainu during certain games, I think in order to get the best out of him and really allow him to reach that world-class level, United need to bring in a ball winner to play alongside him and Mainu to really give him that freedom he needs. But just from a squad building perspective as well, with the likes of Casemiro, Amrabat, McTominay, maybe even Christian Eriksen as well, all likely to depart this summer, United would need to sign another central midfielder as well, and that midfield would probably have to be more of a defensive-minded, holding midfielder, ball-winning type, because with all the players departing that I just mentioned, United would probably be needing a ball-winning midfielder in the squad in general anyway. But with Frank de Jong likely to cost around £70 million and be on around £400,000 per week, signing my ideal option for the ball winning midfielder role, Amadou Onana, would probably be off the table because he'd probably cost around £60 million as well. And the player that I think would be an excellent cheaper alternative to Onana would actually be from Ineos's other club, Nice. But it's not kept from Turam, it's a 24-year-old Algerian, Hicham Boudoui. Now, Boudoui's really gone under the radar over the past few years, with Keprem Turan being the Nice central midfielder that has been most heavily linked with a move away. But in my opinion, Boudoui is just as good as Turan, maybe even better as a sole ball winner. Now, if you do want to see a more in-depth analysis of Boudoui and some potential other Casemiro replacements for the summer, let me know in the comment section and make sure you subscribe to the channel and click the bell so you do get notified when that video comes out. But in short, Boudoui is an aggressive, dynamic ball winning midfielder who has the capabilities of covering ground in the centre of midfield being a tenacious tackler who's not only capable of breaking up opposition attacks, but also transitioning the attack quickly, injecting pace into the play by driving forward with the ball at his feet into space. And whilst his FB Riff report shows a player who's a decent passer, he's definitely not a deeper lying creator. But I don't see that being a massive issue if he's alongside Mainu and De Jong in midfield. And in my opinion, using Boudoui and Mainu either side of De Jong would allow him to play in that kind of regista free role that we saw Andrea Pirlo excel in for AC Milan and Juventus. And using that four-man midfield would also allow United a lot of positional rotation, using movements in the centre of the pitch to drag the opposition around, disrupting their man-to-man -man press and creating space for the likes of Frankie de Jong. Starting in a box shape as a double pivot alongside Boudoui with Mainu and Bruno Fernandes completing the box shape at the top, will entice the opposition's midfield double pivot if they do want to press high up the pitch to push up onto the Jong and Boudoui, 
Where from United can then look to rotate into more of a diamond central midfield shape, pushing Dallow up on the right, allowing them to create an overload in the deeper central midfield area, with De Jong dropping into that deep single pivot position, looking to become the free man. And from here, United would actually be able to create that familiar diamond shape in their own box, the two centre-backs at the wide points and De Jong at the top. And from here, because United would also have three players in central positions ahead of De Jong, with his press resistance and passing abilities, he can then look to receive the ball and try to find the likes of Maynou and Bruno Fernandes in behind the opposition's high midfield press. But the true significance of having a player like Frankie de Jong in the defensive third when the opposition are looking to press high is that rather than dropping more players into that deeper midfield area in order to give you a 7 or an 8 versus a 6, you can instead look to do the alternative, which is push more players higher up the pitch, which in turn is bound to drag some of the opposition midfielders into deeper positions because they don't want to be overloaded at the back being at risk of a long pass upfield. And so the consequence of this is that rather than a 7 or 8 versus a 6 in a defensive third, you now have a 5 versus a 4. But crucially, with this opposition players, but also your own players in this defensive third, there's more space for Frankie de Jong to receive the ball, drop a shoulder, and then exploit the space by driving into it. And this sort of build-up strategy can really only be done with someone who has an extremely high level of press resistance and ball-carrying ability, which de Jong has in abundance. But in this role, Frankie de Jong can also be given the freedom to move where he sees fit with players making movements not necessarily to receive the ball themselves, but to drag opposition players away from the space, allowing Frankie de Jong to move off any man-to-man -man presser that he's facing in the centre of the pitch, and into the space that has been created where he can then look to receive the ball and progress it out of the defensive third. But when United have the ball in the middle third, De Jong can essentially be the orchestrator of the attack, sitting in a deeper position in front of the two centre-backs, in front of the opposition's midfield line, where he can circulate the ball efficiently, look for those incisive passes, carry the ball into space where he sees fit, and all in all, give United that creativity from deep positions that they lack particularly against compact defensive units. But with two central midfielders in Maynou and Boudoui either side of him, even if the fullbacks do push further forward, De Jong has that defensive security behind him to make movements into the final third, picking up positions in behind the opposition's midfield line, which are the exact sort of positions I was talking about in regards to Ilkay Gundogan, and giving Frankie De Jong this security in midfield by having Boudoui and Maynou sitting behind him, and maybe one of the two fullbacks as well, can allow De Jong to get into more advanced areas where he can add chance creating and goal scoring to his game. So overall, I think Frankie De Jong would be a fantastic sign-in. But the question comes, should he be the priority signing for United? Because you have to factor in other things other than the player's individual ability and whether he fits the tactical system. And this is because from a financial point of view, De Jong is going to be expensive. 70 to 75 million pounds just in the transfer fee and probably about 20 million pounds a year in salary, which would make him the club's highest earner. And you'd probably also have to spend another 30 to 40 million pounds to bring in another central midfielder to play that ball winning midfielder role. Hitch and Boudoui would probably be the player I would go with at the moment. And so how does signing De Jong and Boudoui compare with signing Amadou Onana and Alex Garcia? Now even though I did say I would prefer to go with Onana and Garcia, that was really from a squad building perspective. Because for me, the fact that Alex Garcia has got a £10 million release clause is a massive factor because if you sign him alongside Onana, I think you pretty much cover everything that De Jong and Boudoui would have minus the incredible press resistance in the build-up phase, but Garcia would certainly be able to match De Jong in terms of his passing in the middle third. Just from his FB ref report, you can see how good he is. And I'd actually argue that when it comes to creating from these deeper positions in midfield, Garcia might actually be a better passer than De Jong, because his long passing is absolutely phenomenal. Now, there's no doubt that De Jong in the build-up phase, in terms of his ball carrying and his press resistance, is a level above Garcia, but you could also make the argument that with Kobe Mainu there, you don't really need De Jong as much. I'm I mean, Maynou is fantastic in the build-up phase. He's got that sort of press resistance that we do see from Frankie de Jong. And so whilst de Jong would be fantastic, you could make the argument that Maynou and de Jong are a bit too similar. And so signing Onana and Garcia alongside Maynou could actually give United a more balanced midfield than if you set up de Jong with Maynou and Boudoui either side. Because whilst I do think that Frankie de Jong has an incredibly rare skill set that is worth paying top dollar for, but I'd also make the argument that this applies to Amadou Onana as well. Because there are very few central midfielders as physically physically and athletically dominant as Onana is, who also have his level of technical ability in congested areas, passing range and most importantly powerful ball carrying ability through the centre of the pitch. 
Because even though going for Alex Garcia over Frank De Jong would reduce the amount of ball carrying ability you do have in the centre of the pitch, I think Amadou Onana would more than make up for this. Because even though he isn't as fluid or as elegant a ball carrier as De Jong is, in Yoyo Torre-esque fashion, he's got the ability to receive the ball and when the open space is there, he can absolutely power into it. And if you put him alongside Alex Garcia, who's mostly going to sit in a holding midfield role, as well as Kobi Mainu, you can then maybe give Onana more freedom to actually drive forward and being a main progressor of the attack. And so all in all, whether you go for De Jong and Boudoui alongside Mainu or Onana and Garcia, I think both central midfields are pretty well balanced. And I really don't think the difference in ability is that great in the middle third and from a defensive point of view. However, from an individual standpoint, De Jong in the build-up phase in terms of his press resistance is better than both Onana and Garcia. But in a high level possession system, I still don't think this is much of an issue. Because whilst you can't rely on an individual player as much as Frankie De Jong, as the likes of Xabi Alonso at Bayern Leverkusen and De Zerbi at Brighton have shown, if you do have the right system and build up strategy, you should still be able to play out of high pressure in your defensive third and still take advantage of the space in behind the opposition's midfield line. And so the deciding decision as to why I'd go for Garcia and Onana over De Jong and Boudoui is really down to a squad building perspective because United need to improve a lot of positions this summer and so by signing Onana and Garcia for around 70 to 75 million rather than De Jong and Boudoui for between 100 to 110 million, once you also factor in that Onana and Garcia combined are going to be on less money than De Jong, it probably makes sense this summer to go for the cheaper options because in signing Garcia and Onana, I think you're getting two players who in the next few years could prove to be world-class central midfielders because I think both are that good. But nevertheless, in a dream world, I'd bring in De Jong and Onana, but maybe we'd have to wait till next summer when he's got one year left on his contract to bring in the Barcelona man for a more reduced fee. So thank you for watching. If you enjoyed that video, check out some of my others linked in the description along with my Patreon. And remember to subscribe and click the bell so you do get notified when my videos come out.